Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Saturday, November the 4th, 2023. It is currently 8.16 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, right here in this studio right now is, well, one person, me, And this one person is extremely frustrated, extremely irritated, extremely bothered, but at the same time, enjoying myself at the same time. How does that work? I don't know. I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. I'm bothered, but I'm enjoying myself because it has been a fun few days trying to figure something out. So let me explain. I don't know which day it was, but I picked up the historical lectionary, right? Uh, The lectionary, it is is used by the Catholic Church, but, you know, lectionaries date way back into the early church. It gave you the list of, on this day, you'll read this scripture and this scripture. On this day, it'll, you, you know, you'll read this scripture, this scripture. This Sunday, you'll be reading this scripture and this scripture. They were the assigned readings for specific days, for Sundays, feast days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't know what a lectionary is. I'm assuming most of you know. Now, those lectionary lists are very important when you go back and study manuscripts and things because they demonstrate which scriptures were being utilized in Christian worship. If you can find a lectionary list, even if it doesn't give you the text, you can be like, oh, they were using John chapter 1. They were using 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They were using 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you can find the date to the lectionary, then that demonstrates that those texts were available to them at that time. So there's a lot of different things things lectionary list were for. And if you think about it, the idea of a lectionary, you may not like the idea, but I, I think the idea is really awesome. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Just think about this. Can you imagine every Christian church in the world that on every given Sunday, they are all reading the exact same scriptures and a sermon is being preached from one of those scriptures because typically on a Sunday, you have an Old Testament reading, you have a, a psalm, all right, and then you have an epistle, and then you have a gospel. You typically, so you have three readings and a psalm. Can you imagine if all of that were the same? The Old Testament reading was the same, the psalm was the same, the epistle reading was the same, and the gospel reading was the same. And that everyone was hearing the same scriptures read and a sermon from one of those scriptures. I'm not saying that would just immediately bring about unity, but it would be really cool that no matter where you go to church, you know those are the readings and everyone would have access to the same lectionary and everyone would be looking at those scriptures and that lectionary would would be available not just for Sundays. Everyone would be using the same lectionary, weekday lectionary for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday for their own private devotions. I mean, I, to me, that would be a beautiful idea. I'm not saying it would, would fix all of the divisions within Christianity, but it would be a beautiful thought. But those days are long gone. There's no, we're never going back to that. That unity is, is lost. Now, within Catholic churches, they use the same lectionary. So it's, it's at least there in theory. And maybe some other denominations and other groups have a, a, a Lutherans use a, a, a lectionary as well. So it, it's somewhat similar. But again, I, I, I still think the idea is, is awesome. So at any given time within a year, within my Christian life, who, this has happened year after year after year, but usually at some point, sometimes I will dedicate an entire year that I will pick up. In fact, I have it right here. I have it right here next to me. All right. Lectionary, right? I have the lectionary right here next to me and I will pick it up, look for, look for the date, whether it's midweek or whether it's a Sunday, depending on what day I pick it up and go, what's the lectionary reading for that day? I'll look at the lectionary reading and be like, okay, that's awesome. All right. Do I want to look at the, uh, the epistle or the Old Testament reading? Do I want to look at the Psalm? Do I want to look at the gospel reading? Well, the other day I picked it up and lo and behold, It was Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, 
And I have been meditating and working on it and meditating and working on it and meditating and working on it. And I have spent, I, I, I don't even know how many hours, but I have spent so many hours working on Luke chapter 14. Now, my frustration comes in. My aggravation is because I, I still don't know exactly what we should do with the text. And what do I mean by that? Well, there really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to sense that there's almost two approaches to uh, different parts of Luke chapter 14. And we're going to look at the text in a minute. There's a very surface, practical level where people are just like, oh, here's the basic idea. This is all that it's saying. And then there are others are going, no, 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 no. That what looks like very simple, just an easy principle, very surface is it's not really that there's something deeper here. It's pointing to a much more deeper spiritual principle. There's a part of me that wants to go to the deeper spiritual principle, right? But then I'm thinking, but am I doing so because the text is pushing me that direction or am I doing so because of outside voices, outside sources, things that I'm reading that are kind of saying, hey, there's more to the text. D don't, don't just stop with the what, what appears to be surface level meaning. Go deeper because it's a beautiful picture. So there's a part of me that wants to go deeper, but then there's another part of me that goes, I don't know if that's, if that's the case. And this is always a question within hermeneutics. How just surface, do you stay with the text? Here's what the text seems to be saying. Here's who it's written to. Is there any application for us? There's nothing more. But I think sometimes the text is designed in such a way that hermeneutically, it's at least giving you a clue. There's, there's, there's a deeper level here. Now, you've always got to be careful with that. Because to say there's a deeper level, You've got to have some textual justification for it, and you need some kind of textual guardrail to keep you on the road, or you just go off the side of the cliff, and you end up, you know, at the bottom of a <laughs> a cliff, broken into a million pieces hermeneutically, and who knows what you've done to the text. You've twisted it and manipulated it. So it, it's safer to go, look, guys, that's all it says. It's a simple point. This is the point it seems to be making. Let's move on. But then sometimes you're like, I don't know if that's the case. So I've been struggling. Now, if you've listened to our two broadcasts we did for today's focus, we spent not quite two hours, but probably probably relatively almost, almost close to two hours of work on Luke chapter 14. Well, maybe about an hour and a half, I think. Maybe close to an hour and a half. But we've done a little bit of work on Luke chapter 14. And for today's focus, it was more just me presenting ideas and concepts, throwing them out there to try to get you to pick it up and hopefully get you to meditate on it. I don't know if it worked, but that, that was the desire. But here I sit, Saturday night. And I'm still obsessed with Luke 14. I, I, I now I love when that happens. I love when a text just kind of reaches out and grabs you and it's like slaps you around. And when I say slap you around, not so much of conviction, but just grabbing your attention that you just can't move on. You just can't, you can't go, well, what's the next day's passage? Well, the lectionary this week is like, no, you're in Luke 14. No, you're still in Luke 14. No, you're still in Luke 14. You can't leave, which was a good thing because I think if there, if it wasn't, I may have moved on. So I'm trying to force myself to stay with the lectionary and figure it out. So I thought I would turn the microphone this evening and just kind of share some of my hermeneutical struggles and see what you think. And we're going to listen to a little audio showing you how someone just reduces it to the most basic surface level principle. And I just don't know if I can do that. But are you ready? Luke chapter 14. Let's read a little bit of this. We're going to go from Luke 14, verse 1 to verse 11. I'm going to try not to preach this. I'm going to try not to do much teaching here, but I'm just going to try to present a little bit kind of an outline here of Luke 14, 1 through, say, 11, and then try to show you what could be the basic surface level meaning, and is there a spiritual uh, principle? And then we're going to go to some a, a hermeneutical concept that is traced back to the early church. So we're going to have a little bit of fun. 
Hopefully that all makes sense, gets everyone on the same page. Here we go. If you look at Luke chapter 14, I kind of see at least a a three-point outline developing in the beginning. We have a section here about a Sabbath and healing issue, right? A a question, well, I I, I know I'm not going to say so much. Well, there's some questions asked. I'm just going to say a Sabbath and healing issue is spoken of. And then a where to sit issue is spoken of. And then a who to invite issue. And then maybe we call it a marriage banquet. We'll, We'll see. We'll see. But at least three kind of separate sections, a Sabbath and healing issue, a where to sit issue, and a who to invite issue. Are you ready? Let's see if we can detect these three sections. The first one is pretty obvious. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse one. And it came to pass. As he, he there is referencing to, is referencing Jesus, as it came, and it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, they, that they watched him. Jesus is going to one of the chief Pharisees' house to eat. Jesus is coming to dinner. And he's going to the house of a a chief Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees hate Jesus. They're constantly trying to trap Jesus. They're accusing Jesus. Why would he go to the house of someone who hates him? Someone who may be using it as an opportunity to trap him. Well, you could argue this is Jesus demonstrating love and compassion to his enemy. This is Jesus saying, well, as long as they want to talk to me, I'm going to be right there and I'm going to do my best to try to present spiritual truth to help them. There's a lot of different things we could just take from from that. But Jesus goes and they're watching him. And behold, there was a certain man before him, which had the dropsy. Now we spent a lot of time talking about dropsy and what it is and how it, right, people they, uh, that, who have this retain fluid and it can lead to dehydration. And we talked a little bit about uh, dropsy and all of its, con- and all of its symptoms and what it does. So there's a, so Jesus is there. He's eating with the Pharisees. He sees a man with dropsy. Now, most likely this man was not part of the actual dinner party, just so that you know, in biblical culture, a lot of times, especially if someone was there who was kind of famous, like you would have the dinner party, but then all these people would come and kind of just watch. It was almost like a form of entertainment that would watch and listen to the conversation. They're not eating. They're just watching everyone else eat, but they're there for the conversation because the people in that culture didn't just show up just to go, just, you know, throw some food down their throat and say later or talk about the weather. Typically, some kind of interesting conversation would occur and people would almost view it as a form of entertainment. So it either one, there's speculation here, the Pharisees brought this man or had this man show up, maybe invited this man to at least watch, knowing or thinking that Jesus would then do something because remember, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. It's the Sabbath day. So maybe they're thinking, let's bring this man with a disease. Jesus will do something to help this man. And then we'll be like, gotcha, gotcha. You broke the Sabbath or you'll at least we broke all the rules we've added to the Sabbath. Now, that's just wild speculation, see? So you, hermeneutically, you really can't do that. We just know the man is there, and but we do know this. Luke chapter 14, verse 2, And behold, there was a certain man before him uh, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So Jesus realizes there's someone there with a disease. Then he immediately uses this as an opportunity to turn to the lawyers, right? That's what it says, to um, the lawyers and the Pharisees. I'm looking at the text, making sure I got it right. The lawyers and the Pharisees. And he's like, hey, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, to me, this demonstrates that Jesus seemed to kind of know why they're watching him, that, that, that he kind of knows he's there to be set up. It feels like, at least it feels that way. Now, again, I cannot be dogmatic because the text leaves out so much. But we know this, whether Jesus is feeling like he's he's doing a preemptive strike, whether he kind of knows that they've set him up for this, so he's going to go along with it, or maybe just Jesus is like, you know what? I'm going to use this as an opportunity to challenge them. I'm going to challenge them. 
So if he's there to challenge them, what is he attempting to do in this section? Well, look at what happens. So we ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. So Jesus sees this as an opportunity to challenge them. Now, what is he challenging them on? Is he challenging them on the actual Old Testament law of Moses on the Sabbath? Or is he challenging them? Is he challenging their interpretation or all their man-made traditions they've added to the Sabbath? Or is he going to use this as an opportunity to show them what's really in their heart? Now, see, all of this is just wild speculation. Because the text doesn't give us any insight at all here. We have no insight at all here on this t- in this text. Now, look what happens. And uh, and uh, and hel- they held their peace and took him and uh, right, hang on, let me read this again. So Jesus answered, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, "Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath?" And they held their peace. So that they don't, they're afraid to ask anything, or they're afraid to say anything, or they're afraid to answer because they are assuming. I, it's almost like you can feel. I'm not saying that this proves it, but you can almost feel there's a tension, right? And Jesus is kind of like, hey. Hey, I'm going to ask you guys a question because, because they're watching him. So you can kind of feel there's a tension going on. There's a, there's an, this is an adversarial meeting, it almost seems. So then Jesus is like, I'm going to ask a question. And they're like, no, 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 not going to answer, not going to answer because they feel that the question is a trap. That's what it feels. Now, again, I cannot, I cannot be dogmatic about any of that. And I hate speculation when it comes to hermeneutics. I hate speculation when it comes to hermeneutics because that's the, that's the beginning of the end. But it almost feels like they're like, we're not going to answer. Well, obviously, if they're not going to answer, they clearly then feel like that, 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 that however they answer, it's a trap. However they answer, it's a trap. So they're like, we're, just, we're not going to be, we're going to be quiet. We're going to be quiet. We're going to be quiet. They don't want to, on one hand, they don't want to go against the law of Moses. On the, on the other hand, they don't necessarily want to contradict all the rules and regulations that the Pharisees and Sadducees had added and the scribes had added to the law of Moses. Just so that you know, the law of Moses would say, thou shall not do this. And then they would come along and say, oh, but you can't do this and 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 this, which the law never specifically outlined. But they would do that in order to try to keep people far from ever breaking it. Now, you could say their intentions were good. You could say their intentions were right. But the bottom line is they added all of these rules in order to keep you from breaking the actual law. And you may say they were good principles, but the bottom line is they then placed the these burdens upon people and then would basically accuse people of breaking the actual law of God when all you'd actually done is broken one of their traditions. And then Jesus has, has condemned them before by them basically placing their traditions above the word of God. So they, they're, they're afraid to answer. They, they don't answer. But then Jesus, so they held their peace in verse 14, Luke 14, verse 4, he took him and healed him and let him go. So Jesus heals the man. Boom. He's gone. But he lets him go. It's almost like Jesus is like, okay, you can go now. You can go. You're not necessarily here a part of the dinner party. You can go. You can just, you can go home now. You can, you can leave. Now, either did Jesus bring the man along because Jesus knew what he was going to do? Did, did he know that these people brought, like, I don't know exactly. There's so many questions here and there's always danger when there's so many questions because we as Bible teachers and even as Christians who read the Bible, we start filling in the gaps and we can, we, we, we can turn the narrative into something that it's not. And then look what he says. He answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and will not straight straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? He heals this man. And it's almost like Jesus immediately knows what they're thinking. They're immediately thinking, that's it. You broke the Sabbath. You broke the Sabbath. He, he knows their traditions. He knows all because that would be considered work, that he had done something. 
And so then Jesus is, it's almost like he's answer, he's having, he's answering what's going on internally with them because they're not saying a word. And then he's like, Hey, what would you do if you had a donkey? What would you do if you had an ox fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? What would you do? And the assumption is they would just reach down and grab it and pull it out. And they didn't answer. It says they could not answer him again to these things. So, and that's the end of the discussion. 14, 1 through 6 is this question about this, or this issue about the Sabbath and healing. But, but we don't have anything else. Now, we could do a lot of cross-referencing and try to, and try to investigate this and see if there's more. But here's what I want to do. If you were to summarize, what's the basic lesson there? What's the basic lesson? Is the basic lesson to go after the attitude of the Pharisees? That the Pharisees, listen, let me just see if this works. You can tell me if this works. Is the basic lesson here, not so much about the Sabbath, is the basic lesson here is you Pharisees. You care about this external religiosity where you follow all of these rules that are nothing more than man-made traditions and you pat yourself on the back on how godly and holy you are. But when it comes down to it, you care more about yourself. You care more about you than you actually do people. Because if an animal fell into a pit, you would pull it out because, well, that's property that has value to you. But when it comes to a person suffering a disease, you're not so down with it. Is this really to expose their lack of love, compassion, and empathy. Is that what, is this really not so much about the Sabbath? Not even so much about their rules. Is Jesus trying to expose to them that they care a, more about their own religious tradition than they do human beings? Is that the basic, just surface level issue here? I don't know. Or is this a deeper spiritual issue? Is this about the Sabbath? Is it about law? Is it about, is it about man-made tradition? What is this about? What, what really is Jesus' point here? We don't know. Now, do we have a good cross-reference that would help us? I'm just going to leave that alone for now. I'm going to leave that alone for now. I just want to know, do we see, take the, if we take this on the most basic surface level, what lesson would you give to this? Forget a spiritual, uh, some deep spiritual uh, lesson. If you're just to make it the most basic, what would you, what would you come up with? Now, if you go to verse seven, Luke 14, verse seven, and he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms saying unto them. So then Jesus looks around and he notices how some have gone directly for the chief seats, the seats of honor. Now, another translation translates it this way. I'm going to reach down and grab this. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. Now, some people just immediately assume that he's referencing the Pharisees. So is he referencing the Pharisees here? Now, obviously, there's more than one Pharisee because if you go back and look, uh, uh, in response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees. So it seems like there's a bunch of Pharisees here. So it seems like that, that typically it's implied that what Jesus does is he looks around the Pharisees and the lawyers. They're not answering any, any questions. Some, these are some of the religious leaders. And... He looks around and he notices how they would choose the best places for themselves. That the Pharisees, that the religious leaders, they came in and are like, I'm going to sit right there. I'm going to sit next to Jesus or, or whomever, or next to the chief Pharisee. They want those seats of honor. So once again, is Jesus about to go after something like, was the first part about the Sabbath, was it really about their attitudes? He's going with their internal lack of love and compassion for people. And here is he going after their internal desire for prestige, fame, position, and recognition. Because he looks around and he's like, look at all these people. They come in 
everyone else gets pushed to the side because they want the place of honor. They want it. So then what does Jesus say? It says, he tells a parable. It's weird because it's not a typical parable. There's no real characters. It, it's not even really a story. It's just much more a straightforward lesson. But he, he goes on to say this. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding. Now, please note, he adds it as a wedding here. He doesn't say, you would think he would say, hey, when thou art bidden of any man to a dinner. But he doesn't say dinner. He says to a wedding, which then gives you, okay, now is this an indicator that Jesus is using this for a story that goes far beyond the, the, the physical, the tangible? He's going to something spiritual, but he says a wedding. And he says, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. So it's the idea you come walking into a wedding and you're like, I'm going to sit closest to the bride or groom. I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit in the seat of honor. And you're sitting there and you're like, okay, awesome. Everyone's going to notice me. I'm right here. I'm in the best place. And then all of a sudden the person invited you is like, hey man, you got to go back there. This seat is for someone else. And then you have to walk away, go into the back of the room, humbled and humiliated. And Jesus is like, you don't want to do that. So he tells them, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher, then shall thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. So go up higher, then shall thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted." So is Jesus teaching some deep spiritual principle that has something to do with eternal life? Or is Jesus just saying, hey, 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 come on. This is just a basic good idea. This is, this is just smart. Don't put yourself in a position where you could end up looking foolish. Put yourself in a place of humility where you can, where the only place you can go is up. If you go run to the front, you may end up in the back. Don't do that because everyone that exalts himself is going to be a base and he that humble himself is going to be exalted. It's just, just like basic, basic principle. So we have, we have the, the first thing we have in, in Luke 14, one through six is this subject of the Sabbath and healing. What is Jesus trying to demonstrate? And in here, in Luke 14, 7 through 11, what is Jesus trying to demonstrate? Is he simply trying to show the Pharisees that you're, you're arrogant, you're proud, you need to humble yourself, or you're going to be humbled? Is this, is this all that there is to it? Now, there's another section, because in verse 12, he says, so we have, we have the issue pertaining to the Sabbath and healing. Then we have the issue pertaining to where to sit. And then look what he does in verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now that next section seems to indicate that Jesus is trying to develop principles that have something far more to do with your every day, but something greater. So, so really what we have, we have a story of the Sabbath in healing, we have a story of where to sit, and we have a story of where to invite, or whom to invite invite. Now, if we break these to the most basic, then what do we get from it? Care about people more than yourself and your rules. Hey, just be smart and don't put yourself in a place where you can be embarrassed or, or, you know, humbled. Always start in a position of humility because then you can be exalted. And hey, don't just do things for for people who can, you know, pay you back. Do things for people who can't do anything for you. Is that, is that the basic principle? Now, I want you to hear how someone doing a, like a devotional, how they handled verses 7 through 11. All right. Now, I don't have this audio queued up in my studio software. So you're just going to have to listen to it on my iPad. It's not going to be super loud, but it's only like a minute. So I think you'll be able to hear 
exactly how they decided, how, how they, what they think this is teaching. And they take the most basic, like basic approach that I, I think maybe I've ever heard. L- l- listen to how they approach this. Here we go. Anyway, I'm here to witness that, that this reading today is real. And it works exactly how Jesus told it. Now, the truth is that the principle that Jesus is teaching today about humility or humiliation is a principle that can be exercised even outside of dinners. It can it can be the condition of of the heart in every area of life. You can apply it in so many circumstances. A barbecue. Don't take the first brat or chicken off the grill. It might belong to the guy's wife. Wait till others go ahead of you. Waiting to get in on a bus? Don't be so pushy and try to get in before others. Does someone pick you up uh, and a friend up in a car? Giving you a ride with your buddy? Don't go for the front seat right away. Go for the back seat. Everyone needs to take a shower before going out. Let others in your family go first. Only one of your favorite drinks is left. Let others have a chance at it. Oh, I can think of so, so many more situations where this teaching comes into play. Because believe me, after that event, I rehearsed many, many situations. Now, here is the principle. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, a.k.a. Jeff. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Didn't happen that day. This is a great question to ask yourself when others are involved. Am I exalting myself or am I humbling myself? Now, see how basic he makes the lesson? Just in every situation, are you exalting yourself or humbling yourself? Is that the lesson here? Is this the the most basic thing? Hey, have compassion on people. Think about other people. Like you care about your animal thing. And hey, stop exalting yourself. Humble yourself. And hey, when you invite people, stop inviting people that will benefit you. Invite people that you can benefit. Is, is that, is that all we do with these stories? Just make them so basic and, and just surface. Now, is that hermeneutically correct or is that just hermeneutically safe? Or is there something in the text where Jesus seems to be saying, there's more here, guys. There's more here. Now, I don't know if I have a good answer yet. I don't know if I have a good answer. Now, I did pull this out. Listen carefully. According to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of Scripture. The literal and the spiritual, the latter being subdivided into the allegorical, moral, uh, and anagogical senses. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantee all its richness to the living reading of the scripture in the church. So they're basically saying, look, there's, there's basically two main senses, right? That is the literal and the spiritual. Well, that is a very literal approach, very literal. Hey, just humble yourself. Okay, but is there a spiritual sense? And then it said from there, it's broken down. I'm sorry, I'm knocking the microphone across the room to these other senses. All right. You have the allegorical, moral, anagogical and uh, senses. Now here they're going to break these down. All right, you ready? Here we go. The literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of scripture discovered by exegesis following the rules of sound interpretation. All right. All other senses of sacred scripture are based on the literal. So we know the literal. Literally, what is Jesus trying to show us in these stories? That's the, so I think we can figure out the literal to some level. The spiritual, thanks to the unity of God's plan, not only the text of scripture, but also the realities and events about which it speaks can be signed. Is there a spiritual sense here? Is Jesus pointing to something spiritual, something deeper than just this very literal? And then there's a third sense, some people say, the allegorical sense. The allegorical sense, we can acquire a more profound understanding of events by recognizing their significance in Christ. Thus, the crossing of the Red Sea is a sign of or type of Christ's victory and also of Christian baptism. So now, is there an allegory here? 
Is Jesus using these situations to point to a, a deeper spiritual reality? I don't know. The spiritual sense and allegorical sense, they're very similar, obviously, in certain levels. The moral sense, the events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act justly. Now, the moral sense, you could say, what is Jesus trying to morally show us here about the Pharisees? That they only think about themselves? Is that, is that, the, is that the whole simple issue here? And then the anagogical sense uh, means the idea we can we can review we can view the realities and events in terms of their eternal significance, leading us towards our true homeland. So, in other words, can we look at this and go, wait a minute, this is this is this has an eternal signif- significance. This has an eternal significance. This goes beyond. Now, that's, that's kind of an, uh, uh, an ancient tradition in how to handle the scriptures. Now, we could spend a lot more time working on those senses. Whether we agree with that or not, I'm still left with Luke 14 going, I don't know, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Because when, once we're done with those three accounts, right, I, I think about healing in the Sabbath, about where to sit, and about who to invite, then look immediately what he does in f- verse 15. And one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things he said unto him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, immediately that response seems to imply that at least this one person who hears this seems to be immediately taking this to some kind of spiritual and eternal significance, not just practical. And then look what Jesus, then look what Jesus does, starting in verse 16. Then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. Now, immediately Jesus seems to take part of this and starts applying it to a much deeper spiritual level. Now, the, the question is, he's got, he's, he's now, he's got, now he's got a great supper and people are going to be invited. Does this simply go back to who to invite? Or does this next section that he goes from verses 16 to 24, does this have anything to do with all three of those sections? The Sabbath question and the healing? I don't know. It feels like that that's already been, it feels like he abandoned that subject quickly, right? Quickly. And then the next section, where to sit? It, is, it, is it about that? And then the next section about who to invite, is that the section that Jesus then uses for the rest of this? I mean, you're going to get, you're going to get an idea immediately. Look, and he says, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I have many needs. Now this is the idea of people being invited. Now, now the story turns to not who to invite, but how people respond to the invitation. And they all begin to make excuse. So then in verse 21, they all have different excuses. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things that his master of the house began uh, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in that are poor and maimed and halt and blind. Now, wait a minute that now you put this all together. Do you see now how it's all coming to fit together? Because this starts with someone who is at this meal Guess what? Who is sick? Right? And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou commandest, yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now, please note, hey, bring in all of these people who not only you got someone who's sick, right? Which seems to fit this description. But then guess what? You're bringing in people. Guess what? You're bringing in people who are not going to be able to recompense. They're not going to be able to repay you. That fits part of the stories, right? Who to invite? Now, it seems to be implied, Jesus is not stating it, right? That when all of these people who are coming in, they deserve the seat of honor, for coming in. It seems to be implied because look what he says in verse 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Then, hey, the original people who were invited, they're not going to get there. 
These people who are the outcast, who seem to be the people that nobody wants, let them come in and let them have the seat of honor because they're the humble ones. Well, the exalted ones who were originally invited, well, they didn't come. They had excuses. So is Jesus in this last section putting all of the previous sections together in some kind of beautiful spiritual picture that has far more to do with these basic surface level things and has everything to do with eternity and eternal life. Is, is there a deeper sense? Is, does this have, have more than simply a literal sense? The literal just seems so simple. Pharisees, you guys are bad. You care more about your animal than you do people. Hey, you Pharisees. All you care about is getting the position of honor. Hey, you Pharisees, you only invite people if they can recompense you. You Pharisees, you've got bad attitudes towards people. The end. So so the story is, don't be like the Pharisees. Care about people, humble yourself, and invite people who, uh, you know, put other people before yourself. And don't just invite people that can repay you. That's the very literal sense. Now, I'm going to go pick up this again. Let me read this again. According to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of scripture, the literal and the spiritual, the latter being subdivided into the allegorical, moral, and anagogical sense. The profound concordance uh, of the four senses guarantee all the richness to the living reading of scripture in the church. All right. Okay, now here we go. We have the literal sense, which we talked about. We got that. The spiritual sense, thanks to the unity of God's plan, not only the text of scripture, but also the real realities and events about which it speaks can be signs. In other words, these things can be signs of something spiritual, more than literal. They're pointing to something else. Are these events that Jesus is talking about pointing to something else? The allegorical. We can acquire a more profound understanding of events by recognizing their significance in Christ. Or is this whole discussion about what's happening at this meal pointing to uh, the ultimately the eternal supper, the, the supper after judgment when we're in eternal life with Christ? Is it pointing to that? The moral sense, is there, is there a mor- mor- moral here that there's a, a morality lesson? Now, I think the morality lesson could go more with the literal sense. And then the anagogical sense Um. We can, uh, we can view realities and events in terms of their eternal significance. What is the eternal significance of these things? I'm not saying we have to follow that ancient tradition. I'm not saying we have to follow that ancient tradition in any way, shape, or form. We're not bound by that ancient tradition. But that ancient tradition, maybe in Luke 14, there's more here. I just don't know. When I listened to that, that audio I played, hey, you know, if if, uh, if you need to take a shower, but someone else needs one too, let them go first. If you only if your favorite if you have your favorite drink, but there's only one left, let someone else have it. If you're if you're you know get, get, getting ready to get a ride somewhere, and there's someone else is getting a ride as well, let them get the front seat. I, is that what this is about? That seems way too literal. That seems way too just on point. Now you may say that that that's an application, but I don't know if the application is that or the application is something. T- that is much more spiritual. I don't have it figured out yet. I've been working on it all week. But I think in some ways that final story has got to put this all together. I just don't know how. All right. It, it's, it's 9 p.m. now. It's, 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 it's 43 minutes into this and I don't have any good answers. See, I'm waiting for you to give me the good answers and you guys are silent. So I don't know. I don't know what to say. I'm waiting for you guys to say it's this. But feel free to give me your thoughts. News, if at yahoo.com. That's news, if at yahoo.com. Because I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know if I have a good answer. I don't know if I have a good answer. I just, I don't know if I know. Now, I need to know because I'm, I'm very tempted tomorrow morning 
not for Sunday school, but for the morning worship service, telling everyone to open up their Bibles and let's work on Luke chapter 14. I know it may be very repetitive to what I've already done tonight and over the last few days, and I'm sorry if you find it repetitive, but I also know repetitive looking at a text is essential for retention and sometimes for understanding. So if I have to work through it again tomorrow, I may, I may, and I I, I don't like doing that because some people are like, well, I've heard enough on Luke 14. I want to move on, but I don't know if I've heard enough on Luke 14 from any source because I don't know if I completely figured it out yet. I don't want to read too much into it. But this last story, this last story between 16 and 24 seems to move it from a dinner, a meal, to something spiritual with spiritual implications. And even one of the listeners is like, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God seems to immediately moves it forward to something spiritual. And even Jesus, when he tells the story, he turns it into a wedding, not to, not to a supper, but then later on he takes it back to a supper. So I don't, I don't know. I'm looking for every textual clue to give me a clear understanding. And I don't know if I have one. But I thought I would do a little bit of hermeneutical work on it live on the air tonight. I don't, I don't know if I have it figured out. I don't know if I have it figured out. But I'll leave it there. Love to get your thoughts. News. IF at yahoo.com. News. IF at yahoo.com. Yes, I know this is like now three hours. Oh, maybe not, not total three hours, probably about two, two and a half hours on Luke 14, probably more than you've ever wanted it discussed. And I know I'm not teaching it in a normal way. The normal way is a pastor just looks at the passage, comes up with two or three points, says, here's Luke 14, here's two or three points. Everybody's like, amen, what a great sermon. The point is, is that really what the text is saying? And you know, here, I love to really try to get us to think and meditate and take the text apart and figure out exactly what it's saying. We don't want to, we don't want to make it say something it doesn't say, but we, we don't want to so simplify it that we miss what it's actually saying. We don't want to put something that's not there, but we don't want to ignore what's there just because we're going to go with the most basic, literal, simple perspective on it. And if this is just like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, then of course, we, we, that just falls into the law category. I think this may be pointing to something deeper that would be more gospel category. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Love to get your thoughts. Please email them to me now. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks for a little Saturday night hermeneutical discussion. Hopefully it will spark you to spend some time the rest of this evening thinking about Luke 14, and I'd love to see if you can figure it out. Thanks for listening. God bless.